Yes, all right. Good morning, everybody. Uh, happy Lord's Day. Let's go ahead and open up, please, to Ephesians chapter 1. And just kind of, as I put my slide up there to recall where we were, it's been a couple weeks. I think it's been three weeks ago now, actually, that we've begun our study on the book of Ephesians. And we've had a couple uh, weeks of interim teachings. And last week, remember, Pastor Brian uh, spoke, and we all had a good roundtable discussion about unity and and in the church and so uh, we now come back to uh, resume and pick up our study here and three weeks ago we began with an introduction and so if you have your notebooks uh, i pray you kept them and you bring them if not i do have some more notebooks there if you want to uh to start journaling and taking your notes i certainly encourage that we will be going uh lord willing we will be going through ephesians in its entirety uh, i've had some people ask me you know are we doing the 1689 when are we getting back to that uh, we're going to take a break on that. We're going to go through the book of Ephesians. So uh, you can put your 1689s on uh, somewhere in the car, on the bookshelf somewhere, and, and uh, we'll get back to those, Lord willing, at some point. Uh, but who can recall anything just by way of review, uh, maybe from your notes, maybe from recollection of the teaching, or guys certainly from our church history study? I gave you a lot of uh, church history uh, kind of synopsis, kind of a survey or an overview in, in the introduction that I began a couple weeks ago of Paul, right, because he is the writer here, as you see in verse 1 there, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. So the writer of this letter is Paul, and, and we went through the, the uh, historical context of going through his mission journeys. To, I wanted to try to build this picture for us of Paul and uh, of who he was, and then through his conversion, and then through his missionary journeys. And so uh, anything kind of pop up to mind about those things, or... Uh, anything that you recall or, or want to discuss or have thought about and have questions in your notebooks that you want to talk about before we, uh, before we go on? Or any ideas or thoughts about Ephesians that you want to uh, share with us before we get going? I was reading here that uh, on the background setting that, uh, that Paul had left Priscilla and Aquila there, and they were the, the two main... Um, Good. Yeah, and so uh, that's a good question, good thought, Jose. We went through a little bit of that. Like I said, it's hard to it's hard to fit in uh, th those missionary journeys. About ten years of mission journeys, uh, and so I had whatever I had thirty minutes to kind of get through some of it last week to hit some high spots. And yeah, when they were so they were in Corinth. Paul was in Corinth, and that's where he met Aquila and Priscilla. Uh, he was there for eighteen months, and. Um, so this was on his second missionary journey, okay, second trip, and they were in Corinth. He meets Aquila and Priscilla, and they then sail across. Actually, I have my, I do have a map that I pray was helpful and beneficial. So, um, yeah, Corinth is over here. They sp he spends 18 months here at Corinth, and uh, he writes the letters of First and Second uh, Thessalonians back to the church at Thessalonica. And then uh, he meets Aquila and Priscilla. They sail over uh, to, uh, to uh, Ephesus at the end of his second journey. And so remember, he's not there for long. Uh, he goes in there, he talks to some of the Jews, and they ask him. Remember, they invite him to stay, and he says no. But if the Lord wills, I'll return. He leaves Aquila and Priscilla there, and they meet Apollos actually there. And then he continues on to his journey. Uh, they do go to Jerusalem, but then remember, he comes back up to Antioch of Syria, which, uh, like I told you, is the home base. Of, of where his missionary journeys were. And so, yes, ma'am? Um, isn't Paul in prison now writing to the church of Good, Asia? yes. And it's like the only letter he wrote to the churches that wasn't like a, a warning. Like this one was more of a... This one, that's a good point. Yeah, good. And so um, there are some more instruction, like you're saying, in, like in there. It was meant to be given out or circulated. Good. Yes, yes, good point. Uh, we're going to lead into that in just a moment. That's a great point that uh, some would even, uh, some even doubt that this, maybe not doubt that it's specific, I should say not doubt that it's to the church. We know it's Holy Spirit inspired. Uh, we know Paul to be the writer, but some would say it's not even directed intentionally to just the church at Ephesus. Because it says here, though, look, it says uh, in verse 1, to the saints who are in, Ephe in Ephesus. So it says, oh, well, certainly it's to Ephesians to the Ephesians, but there are some of the earlier manuscripts that don't include the word to the church at Ephesus specifically. There are some that do and some that don't, and so uh, there will be some people that say it is a letter intentionally directly to 
uh, the church at Ephesus, and some would say, no, it was a general letter that was given to be circulated around the churches, and regardless, we know these letters were circulated around the churches. It would go to Philippi, there would be copies of these made, and they would circulate to all the other churches, and same with Ephesus, and same with all these, okay? Um, so, uh, just back up a couple steps to say, this was the second journey. Now, the third journey is when uh, he leaves, Paul and Silas leave, and they then go to uh, Ephesus right over here, and they spend three years then on that journey. So this is his third journey. They spend three years in Ephesus, uh, and there he is, he is teaching um, in a school. He is able to, to do um, spread the gospel for several years, and then remember we talked about this riot that ensues of any Imran, maybe that's prompting your memory to remember, why did Paul have to leave uh, Ephesus? Remember there was a, a riot that happened and ensued, and, and anybody remember why was that? What was the cause of that? The false idol gods. Yeah, the false idols, uh, idols and the gods, because what was happening? It's the goddess Artemis, or Diana, okay, is the false goddess that that area was worshiping the most, and they had all their gods, but that was the primary one. And remember, what was the reason? Do you remember? Money. Yes, because the idol makers, the people who made their living making these idols, and, and remember, this Ephesus is a huge commerce Roman capital city. Uh, lots of people in and out, transient. And so they would come, they would, you know, they could sell these little idols, you know, and, and to the people that are coming in and out. And then certainly of all the people that lived in the area, that they would have these idols to worship at their home. So Paul was teaching and, and people were being converted and not buying these things and affecting their livelihood. And so uh, they come after Paul and his entourage. And so Paul leaves there and uh, makes his way back to um, uh, Jerusalem. And so now we're going to see, uh, actually go back to Acts chapter 20. We'll come back to Ephesians here in just a moment. But look back to Acts chapter 20. And we're going to see the end of his third mission journey now. And we have three missionary journeys recorded uh, of Paul's in the book of Acts. Okay, so this is the end of the third one now. And he stops by... Uh, Miletus, which is an area just outside of Ephesus, and so maybe I should have had the map closer in slides, but here you go. Um, Miletus is right here, Ephesus right there. So don't follow this red. This red track is the track of the second trip. On his third trip, he, uh, he leaves Ephesus and he travels by land to um, Thessalonica and Philippi and Berea and Corinth and all these places he had already been. Then he backtracks by land again, and he comes to Miletus, and he doesn't go to Ephesus. He goes to Miletus because he's leaving there by boat to go back and to return to Jerusalem. So he calls for the elders of the church from Ephesus to come at port while he's going to catch his ship and move on so that he doesn't have to go to Ephesus and then get to Miletus. He's on a time frame. He's trying to get Jerusalem uh, for the times of festivals and things that would be happening um, that, that he's trying to attend and get to. Okay, so let's look at this account. Um, that's not right. Let me get to it. It's going to be in Acts chapter 20. We'll start in verse 17. And uh, who could read that for us? Let's read 17 uh, all the way to the end. To verse 38. It is a good bit, but I think it's going to be helpful in our understanding. Anybody? I'll do it if I can get there. <laughs> right. <clears throat> now from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church to come to him. And when they came to him, he said to them, you yourselves know how, long, how I lived among you the whole time, from the first day that I set foot in Asia, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials that happened to me through the plots of the Jews. Hmm. How I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public and from house to house, testifying both to Jews and to the Greeks of repentance towards God. I'm sorry, testifying both to Jew and Greeks of repentance towards God and of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And now, behold, I am in Jerusalem, 
constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me. Pause there. So this is giving us an idea of where we're heading here with Paul, right? Um, he's being led by the Spirit, obviously, in all that he does. Um, but now he's heading, you see there, I'm going to Jerusalem. So that's, that's the ship he's going to get on that I'm referring to. And it says that I don't know what's going to happen except for I know this, right? That the Lord has told me, the Spirit has told me, imprisonment and afflictions await me. Uh, and so let's see uh, what his reaction is going to be to that of, hey, I don't want to have that happen, so I better, you know, I think of Jonah, right? I don't want to do that. I'm going to jump on a ship and go the other way. Uh, that is never what we see of Paul in the scriptures. He is always uh, patient and humble and loving and caring for others, even while he's going to be afflicted, and, and even in his conversion. Go back to Acts chapter 9 in, in the conversion when he's saved. Uh, the Lord tells Ananias, the man who, remember, heals his blindness uh, because Saul's blinded, remember, and he says, uh, he will suffer great things for my name's sake. He said, he's a chosen vessel, and I will tell him the things that he will do for me and the things that he will suffer greatly for my name's sake. So this was a ministry that Paul was called to, and he knew what it entailed. Okay, so let's, let's see how he reacts here. Prisonment and affliction awaits me, but I do not count my life of any value nor is precious to myself. Mm -hmm. If only I may finish my course and the ministry that I received from Lord Jesus, to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. And now, behold, I know that none of you among whom I have gone out, gone about proclaiming the kingdom will see my face again. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all, for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. Pay careful attention to yourselves and of all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained through his own blood. Pause. Thank you, Greg. Um, so... You see it here, I'm finishing my course. I, I'm not concerned about my life. In Philippians, he says, you know, uh, I count it as dung. I count all things as dung. They are meaningless. They mean nothing. Um, just to fight the fight and run the race in the course that's been set before me. So you see, this is a heartfelt uh, farewell, as I have written there, because what did he say? He's telling these elders of this church, he's saying, you're not ever going to see me again. He's saying, I'm telling you now what's in store for me. And it, it says, I know that none among you whom I've gone about proclaiming the kingdom to will see my face again. Meaning, not this side of heaven, right? I know what's in store for me. And so imagine the tears, right? And the, and the uh, embracing and the things that would be happening in this moment as Paul's sharing with them, uh, you know, you're never going to see me again. And so he doesn't, you know, reflect here, and, and at least we're not, we don't have other things recorded, but what we do have recorded is, he charges them. You see it? Uh, do not shrink from declaring the counsel of God. Pay attention to yourselves and to the flock that the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Uh, talking to these elders, right? The pastors. Okay? Uh, go ahead and pick up in 29, please. Um, I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. So we shouldn't be shocked, right? Paul says here to warn this church that he planted, that he loves, and he tells them, I'm leaving, and wolves are coming. Uh, just know that that's going to be the case. You should understand that's the case for us in the church today. And he says, notice, not will they only come in among you, but they will come from among you. He says, from among your own people, these wolves will show themselves and come up. So to be guarding the flock, to be watching yourself, and so we should always be in guard for those things. Therefore, be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease day or night to admonish everyone with tears. And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Mm -hmm. I coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. You yourselves know that these hands minister to the ne my necessities and to those who are with me. In all things, I have shown you that by working hard in this way, we must... Help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Mm. Uh, and when he was, and when he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. And there was much weeping on the part of all. He embraced <coughs> Paul and kissed him, being sorrowful most of all because of the word he had spoken, that they would not see his face again, and they accompanied him, accompanied him to the ship. Okay, thank you, brother. 
Okay, so we can flip to Ephesians 1 now. Um, while we're doing that, so this third journey, he's there in about 54 to 56 AD. Okay, so uh, he now makes his trip back to Jerusalem. He will leave Miletus there. Uh, he will, as he said, not see those people again. He makes his way to Jerusalem in about 57 AD. And the rest of Paul's story goes that he is falsely accused by some Jews in Jerusalem because, remember, the Jews now hate him. Why do the Jews hate Paul? Turned on. What? Turned he turned on them, right? When he was converted, he went from persecuting the Christians and the followers of the way, right, or of Jesus, and now he is a proponent and a, a teacher of the way of Jesus that they hate and despise and that they killed, right, whom they killed. So uh, they hate Paul. They falsely accuse him of bringing a Gentile into the inner court of the temple. Uh, we see that they drag him out of the temple, and they start to beat him, and they're going to kill him. And then a Roman cohort uh, named Claudius Lysias uh, intervenes uh, by God's providence, we know, because he saves Paul and takes Paul into custody. Paul is then later uh, you know, charged by the Jews. He goes before the Sanhedrin uh, on a day. And uh, then the cohort takes him and says, no, we're going to continue to keep custody of Paul. They take him to uh, Felix, a Roman governor. He is tried before Felix. Felix finds nothing wrong with him, uh, you know, that he did anything wrong or worthy of punishment or imprisonment or death. And so uh, because, though, Felix likes the Jews, it tells us later in Acts that he showed them a favor and kept Paul uh, contained for, uh, detained, I should say, for two years until the next governor came in. So he's kind of playing the, I don't want to deal with this situation, so I'll just kind of wait till the next guy that follows me, and I'll let him deal with that baggage. So uh, Paul sits there detained in kind of a house arrest situation for two years. Then Festus, the next governor, comes and hears him, and he finds nothing wrong with Paul and tells the Jews the same thing. Uh, then he goes before King Herod Agrippa II. He finds nothing wrong with Paul. Uh, but Paul uh, insists that he should be taken to Caesar because he is a Roman citizen. And the, I would tell you the primary reason that he is doing that is because God has told him before this point that he will go to Rome. Uh, so he has, has claimed Roman citizenship and says, I appeal to Caesar. And so Festus sends him to Caesar. And now he is taken to Rome uh, where he is placed under house arrest. Okay, So he is imprisoned. Uh, but it is different imprisonment. He is in a house that he is able to pay for in his own rent, so he's able to make money. He's able to have visitors coming and going. Uh, he is able to uh, write letters and have people dictate or have people take letters that he is dictating to them. And, and that goes to Shannon's point to say it is this time now when he is under house arrest in Rome, about 61 to 62 AD. And so this is about five years after he left Ephesus. Okay, so he spends three years in Ephesus. He left there, and this is about five years later now. He is in prison in house arrest in Rome, waiting trial uh, by Caesar, who at that time was the emperor Nero. Okay, and uh, he, again, is allowed freedom to have people come. He writes this letter. He actually writes four letters um, uh, at this time. And so these letters are considered or are called the uh, prison epistles, and they would be Philemon, Colossians, Ephesians, and Philippians. Okay, uh, so those would be these four. There is another. Uh, so these four prison uh, prison epistles are Philemon, because I believe this is in the order they're written. Philemon, Colossians, Ephesians, Philippians. So this letter is written at, at that time, and he is going to send it, you know, by courier messenger back to the church at Ephesus just to kind of round out the rest of Paul's life. Uh, he will be released by Nero. So he's found innocent. He's released in 62 AD by Nero. And it is believed, we don't have record of this, but it's believed that he goes on another mission journey because he's Paul and that's what he does. Uh, it's believed that he went to the area of Spain because of some writings and some things that are said in the New Testament as well as other uh, outside of the Bible writings. And so regardless, we believe him to, to certainly be, still be doing the work of an evangelist and a work of a preacher and an elder and a, an apostle. And then what happens is in 64 AD, uh, mm -hmm. something changes the, the um, 
structure of the church in Rome. I think I brought this up a couple weeks ago. Anybody remember? What is the major event that happens that changes the landscape for the church in Rome at that time? Fire. Fire. Good. The, the fire of Rome of 64 AD. Okay. Nero, in fact, is believed to be the one who set it on fire, and then he blames the Christians. The Christians now become, uh, you know, numero uno uh, enemy of the state. Okay, and so the people hate the Christians, and so now Christians are under severe persecution, and by the Roman authorities. Um, so it, in 66 A.D., Paul is uh, taken again by Nero, and he is now put into imprisonment, which is totally different this time, kind of a dungeon, like a hole in the ground, um, where he is chained in bondage there, and that uh, is where, let me back up a, a second just to say, in that 62 to 66, that four-year interim where we believe he's on a missionary journey, he writes the letter also of First Timothy uh, and Titus. So to these two men who are appointed by Paul as elders. Those are called the pastoral epistles. So he writes 1 Timothy and Titus, and then he is put into this imprisonment, but we know uh, that he is able to have somebody dictate for him uh, his writings because his last letter that he writes is the book of 2 Timothy. And so you'll see that reflected in that letter about how I am in bondage and how uh, that's where he talks about, you know, fighting the good fight. Uh, and I am I'm at the end of this course and the end of this thing, and he is encouraging, even in that moment, in a dungeon chained to the ground, he's encouraging Timothy on how to be a pastor and an elder to the church and how to love uh, the church that Christ gave himself for. Okay, so uh, he doesn't get out of that imprisonment. Uh, Nero uh, executes him, and he is executed in about 66 or 67 A.D., uh, it, Peter actually is executed by Nero at the same time. Peter, if you know, uh, might recall from church history, was crucified upside down because the Romans were still using crucifixion for execution. They did not crucify Paul, however, because he was a Roman citizen. Uh, they would not crucify Roman citizens, so Paul was beheaded and Peter was uh, crucified. And so those two actually uh, gave themselves for the Lord and were martyred around the same time. So all of that... Uh, to, to give our introduction and start in here this morning. So I'll pause there uh, just for a brief time of recap or questions or comments or clarifications or anything that you guys might have. And I pray that it's helpful. I know I got feedback from Angelo and a couple others that may be like me uh, that kind of like church history and, and see the timeline and see the maps and hang in your brain how this works and what that looks like. Uh, there may be others of you here who are like, hey, man, let's get into it. You've had, a, <laughs> you've had 40 minutes of introduction and recap of the book of Acts. Um, and that's okay, you know, we're not all built the same. But any questions or thoughts or comments on, on any of that, I, I pray that it's helpful to build in your mind what this looks like. This isn't something that's all, you know, segregated, that Paul wrote this letter and this letter and this letter. Like, how does that all flow and work into one another? And the book of Acts is helpful in showing his journey and leading to this point now of writing all these letters and going to all these churches and going through all this turmoil and all this suffering, all this persecution, uh, you know, from Lister being stoned and left for dead, uh, you know, just on and on and on to house arrest and under Roman authority, uh, you know, and now to uh, being in prison in, in, in a dungeon and, uh, and writing a letter before, you know, before he's killed. Uh, what do you guys think? What do you guys have? In? Yeah. Um, when did he write the letter of Romans? Was it before he uh, was in Rome? No, so he looked, wrote the letter of Romans on that third missionary journey. Um, after so he's at Ephesus for three years and then he goes over through Macedonia on the map there and goes over to Corinth and when he's at Corinth for the second time there is when it's believed he wrote the book of Romans and sent it to the church at Rome so uh, that's a, I'm sorry way before filing and then yes before the imprisonment before the end of the third journey um, so it was uh, important because a uh, good point to note there Sky is that Romans he wrote he didn't plant the church in Rome he wrote to the church at Rome to encourage them. He was then taken to Rome, but he encouraged them before that. Uh, Colossians is, is the same. He, he wasn't, uh, the church at Colossae, he wasn't instrumental in planting. It says in both those letters at the beginning, since I've heard of your faith, uh, I write you to encourage you those things. And so that's a difference with the book of Romans. But good question, and I'll give you this because you'll remember it from church history. But remember the way to know that is first, uh, first trip, he wrote one book one letter. Second trip, he wrote two letters. Third trip, he wrote three letters. 
uh, and I can tell them to you later if you want the list. Uh, then he had four in that first uh, house arrest, and then two that we just talked about when he got out, and one more in that last imprisonment. So one, two, three is kind of easy, and Romans was on the third one. When he wrote Romans in, the, in there, that um, this, you know, part of the letter was that, like, I long to come see you, or I'm going to come see you. That's right. Yeah. That's right. So see how it kind of makes sense, right? It reconciles in our minds to say he hadn't been there yet, but he said, I, I pray to come see you. I want to come see you, and I, and I plan to come see you. Um, and then later we find that the Holy Spirit told him, uh, God told him that he must go to Rome. And so uh, this is how we see. Uh, lo and behold, Paul probably didn't understand that the way, oh, yeah, you, you got to go to Rome. And by the way, the way you're going to go is you're going to be imprisoned. <laughs> uh, we're going to have you captured and almost beaten and killed by the Jews, and the Romans are going to take you into custody, and that's how you're going to get to Rome. So it wasn't really on a vacation or on Paul's, at Paul's leisure or on his timeline, but yet always in God's timeline and how he appointed for it to happen. How old was Paul? He, died. Uh, he he was born, I think, in around 4 A.D., uh, so he was around 60-ish. Okay, so uh, that would put him, you know, if Christ was born probably around three or four, two, three, four B.C., you know, he's about eight years-ish, so call it almost a decade older, uh, excuse me, than, uh, excuse me, younger than Christ. Okay. And his journey to Rome and when he was at Rome at first, it was kind of like house arrest, though, right? Like he had some freedom. That's right. That's right. He could do his work and his business. He could have visitors come and go because, again, the two Roman governors had found nothing wrong. It's the Jews who are saying he deserves it. And the Romans are like, look, you're just saying it because of your religious things. He, they, he's done nothing against the state of Rome, and that's all we care about. And so uh, just to kind of be pleasing to the Jews, they kept him, you know, kind of under their thumb. But, yeah, they gave him leeways and, and leisures. Yeah. Sounds familiar. <laughs> Good. Any, anybody else? Comments, questions, thoughts? It's kind of how it went with Christ. Right? Yeah, indeed. Okay. Well, the purpose. So we've talked about uh, the author. We've talked about the date and the context. And so now let's talk about the purpose of the epistle. We saw it there in Acts. That's why we just went there to Acts chapter 20. The purpose of this letter uh, is to encourage the saints, okay, to remind the church of their blessings and, in fact, their spiritual blessings in Christ and to charge them to live according to those things. So uh, the book of Ephesians takes on a common uh, kind of pattern, if you will, of, of Paul's letters where the first half of it is this reminder of Christ and what is in Christ and of doctrine and of theology. Then the second half is usually exhortation to encourage them to live according to that. So if you understand, it's doctrine and teaching of what they should believe and then application of how you should live this and what it should look like. Makes sense, right? Uh, we certainly try to tailor our sermons in that manner, right? or any Bible study or anything we do. We want to draw application, right, of, uh, of sermons. So I would say that is definitely, certainly uh, speak personally, but that is definitely my intention when you come to a text and certainly in preaching is to, um, you know, to explain, uh, to exhort, and then to give application, okay, to explain and teach the text and see what it means than to exhort and to encourage people to live by it, right, and find application in it. If we're just reading and studying and talking just to just talk to one another, right, and we're just reading just to read, I mean, what's, what's the use of it, right? We can sit up here and we can have head knowledge and we can have all this, and I think of 1 Corinthians, you know, as Paul says that, I can speak in the tongue of angels and I can do this and I can do that and I can do all these great things that are impossible, uh, and yet through God I could do them, but... If I do them without love, I'm what? Gong. I'm the noisy gong, right? It, it's, it's uh, so, yeah, in that, we want to continue to have application and find that. So you'll certainly see that uh, in the writing of this epistle. Hey, Utes, tell the rest of these guys what the word epistle means. Somebody. What's the word epistle mean? Letter. What, what? I heard one. Letter. Letter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good. It means a letter, okay? Epistle, uh, the letter written here. So uh, the theme, we see multiple themes in, in a lot of these letters, but there's usually overarching themes. And the theme of this uh, letter is the fullness of Christ in the church, okay? 
um, the fullness of Christ in the church, and the believers, again, blessings or riches in Christ, the things that we have in Christ and the fullness of Christ. So, uh, you know, he's going to want us to understand in these first three chapters. So there's six chapters in, in Ephesians. So, again, the first half is going to be about doctrine and instruction uh, and the things that we should know and why we should know them to, to know proper things. And then the second half is going to be how to apply those things and the effect that those things should have on our lives. Lots of application in the book of Ephesians. Yeah, lots. Okay, so let's get into it. We see this, uh, these themes immediately in chapter 1. Holy cow, 10 minutes left. Just boom, like that. God bless you. Uh, Paul speaks to our spiritual blessings in Christ. Okay, first, he gives a salutation or a greeting in the first two verses. Look at it. He says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus, who are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, verse 3, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, verse 8, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him we obtain an inheritance having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we, who were the first to hope in Christ, might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it, to the praise of his glory. And Father, we come to you and uh, we just thank you for this time we've had as we're even coming to a close here. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the work you do in us and uh, help us to continue to retain this knowledge that we would love you more, better worship you, uh, that we would have better application, Lord, that we would be more like you is our prayer here in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we have a few minutes. We will not get into uh, verse 3 and on. We'll just look at this uh, salutation here. Uh, for today, and then we can have a couple minutes of discussion. Um, as he says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, uh, to the saints which are in Ephesus. I spoke to that already. Uh, those words at Ephesus are in some of the older manuscripts. They're, they're not in some of the older manuscripts. But for us, what does that mean? Does it mean uh, anything? What do, we, what do we take from that? What do you guys think about that? Is it a huge deal and a, a hill that we should die on to, to find out were the words in Ephesus there or not? Or what is, maybe we can see a bigger picture, which would be what? Yeah, he's uh, talking to the, to the body, not just. I mean, it, it's kind of weird that, you know, the name of the book, you know, it's Ephesus and it's not in, or it's, you, you're saying that in some of the manuscripts is not written. Right. It doesn't say at Ephesus. So. But I think the point you're on, the trail you're on, is the bigger point. Yeah. That it's, it's written to believers, mm -hmm. right? Uh, as we talk about Hebrews, who's the writer of Hebrews? Paul. Oh, gosh, you guys. Bam! Oh, nobody it, knows. It may be Paul. Nobody it may knows. be nobody Paul. Uh, but, um, trick question. Yeah. But the point of it is, we may not know who the human author is of Hebrews, but what do we know? God inspired. It's written by the Holy it's Spirit. Inspired. It's been given by God, and it's in this book of these 66 canonized books that we have. And so if God is sovereign, as we say, in creation and salvation and all things, he is able to preserve the books of the Bible that he wants to be in the Bible. Do you understand? It, it didn't have to do with men on a committee, like we talked about in the 1689, who made these decisions. It happened to do with God, who was the one ordaining the people and what to put in there. Uh, so just like we don't know who the writer may be of Hebrews, we know that the Holy Spirit is the writer and that it's in the inspired word of God. So does it matter in the big scheme of things if we know was this letter, was it Paul's intention to write it to the Ephesians or to the church in general? It really doesn't matter. 
because it is here in the Bible for us as the church in general. And we're not the church at Ephesus, right? But it's still for us and for our edification and sanctification. Right? Make sense? Yep. Yes, sir. And as you were saying, it shouldn't matter. It's to a point where, you know, we really, it doesn't matter who wrote it, because now we're like saying, well, I think it was this guy. So you, you get into this conversation that to me is a waste of time compared to the Word of God, you know, it's, it's just be happy that we have it, be happy that it's inspired by the Word of God. And study, sure. You know, but a lot of the books are written where at the beginning they say so-and-so wrote it, right? I'm saying that's oh, yeah. usually the... Yeah, certainly. There's patterns to that, yeah. And, and yeah, it, it just, there's places and, and there's places for those discussions, and, uh, and that's yeah. okay. But the bigger part of it is, you know, that this is God's inspired word. So as we close here, let's try to do what we've talked about and uh, find some direction and application for us in this introduction in the first two verses. Uh, we are not going to get into, uh, we'll get into all this next week about apostleship and about uh, predestination and election and all those things as we see them right here. Bam, Ephesians 1, first thing he wants to talk about are those things. Um, so... Uh, Thoughts? What What do you guys have? Any Any insight or input as to what's What can be our take home for for today? And certainly from three weeks ago as well. This introduction uh, and these this greeting and this this uh, salutation by Paul. Anything that we can uh, take home for application or uh, anything that's been informative that's helpful uh, to us in this? Yes, ma'am. I think both from the the Acts chapter twenty that you brought us to and the Ephesus, it comes down to church unity. Amen. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, you can see all through Paul's letters uh, the desire he has for church unity. Uh, you want to see it from even greater perspective? It's all in God's Word, but go to John 17 and read Jesus' prayer uh, to the Father on behalf of his disciples, meaning all disciples that will ever come, all believers, and how he says uh, that they may be, meaning believers, that they may be one as we are one as the Son and the Father are one, is Jesus' desire for the church. Uh, so, yeah, good. Thank you for that. That's certainly been a, a, a topic of discussion and application that we're working on, right, that we're all trying to work on, but that we've definitely put an emphasis on lately, uh, unity in the church, right, and love in the church. Anything else? I like the, the apostleship, you know, shows that he, you know, he's chosen, that we all are chosen, and that he makes, you know, straight off the... Uh, the beginning, you know, an apostle. So he's, yes. like, he's like saying, you know, I am chosen for this. this yes. Is what I, you know, this is, Good. Um, yeah, and, and to your point, uh, Jose, the next words, mm -hmm. by the will of God. Right. Yeah. Good. Okay, awesome. Well, uh, go ahead and read through, you know, homework for next week, read through chapter one. If you don't have a reading plan or a lot of devotions or you're looking for something to read um, in the evenings or whatever, if you've got some time, I would say, read through a chapter of Ephesians every day that we do this study. Uh, it's only going to be beneficial uh, for you. I know some of you have done that. I know I've done that. Some do maybe Proverbs, but if you're reading through Ephesians, it's only six chapters. Uh, you, you know us. We're going to be in it for a long time. So read through it, read through it, read through it. But certainly if you can read through chapter one, uh, you know, and, and be prepared uh, for next week, we will, uh, Lord willing, convene and, and get back to our study at that time. Yes, ma'am? Um, it's bothering me that I don't have the books now because I know them oh. all except for the first and the second. Hey, that's okay. I like that there's other people like me that that yeah, bothers you. That bothers okay. me. Uh, I know it doesn't matter. Good. We got two minutes. It's okay. Yeah. So, uh, first, first journey, book. one book. Uh, first the, book the he writes is the book of Galatians. Oh, see, because that first trip was in that area of Galatia. We went over three weeks. You'll see it on the video. I know you want to hear that day. Okay. Um, so, first book is Galatians. Second trip, he writes two letters. Uh, he writes them when he is at Corinth, and he writes First and Second Thessalonians. Okay, First and Second Thessalonians. The what's doing here? Third missionary journey. Then he writes how many books? Three. How many letters? Okay, good. So at Ephesus for three years, he writes First and Second Corinthians. Then when he goes to Corinth on that journey, he writes the Book of Romans. Sorry, I'm trying. This is how I remember it all. I have to. Tr I have to track the journey to know where it's at. Uh, so then he makes it to Jerusalem. He is taken into custody under house arrest. He writes Philemon, Colossians, Ephesians, and Philippians. All right, we got those. Then he's released from prison. He writes First Timothy and Titus, 
And then when he's taken into that second imprisonment before his death, he writes second. What was the third trip? Again? Third trip is uh, first and second Corinthians and Romans. Romans. And you notice I do not have Hebrews on that list. But it's probably him. I don't believe so, but really? it, it is it is definitely a possibility. What do you um, think then? Is it a possibility that it's we'll multiple talk more writers about it. too? Because there's some books. It that definitely have... could be Paul for sure. There's many there's many uh, viable suspects. You know, I just it's a personal thing. We we don't know, but one day we will know, right? That's on your list. That's got to be a list. If, we, if you have a list that you're making for the Lord of questions you're going to have, like when you get there, you're going to remember this list yeah, yeah, or be yeah, able yeah. to pull out of your pocket. Like, oh, yeah, God, I wanted to know this. Like, yeah, I, I get the I get the idea. It's fun to think. But uh, but we will know one day, and we'll be able to converse with them and talk with them. That's a pretty amazing thing. I had a cool thought yesterday. Can people that are in heaven, are they praying for us? Do they pray? Can we pray to God? It's a very good thought. <laughs> I mean, if you're worshiping, I don't know. Right? I just, I don't know, just something I thought about. It's a very good thought. But we do know there is one mediator, right, between God and man. So we know there is one in heaven praying for us and interceding on our behalf. Good. All right, let's close it out. Sky, would you pray for us, brother? Sure. Thank you. Father God, thank you for enlightening us this morning and helping us to understand better your, your gospel that you've sent to us, Lord. Thank you for putting on Pastor Craig's heart to help us with that, Lord, and um, just thank you for this day to come together in fellowship and mm-hmm. to worship you, Lord, and um, just um, help this, help us all to just keep you at the top of our minds and our hearts and everything we do all week long and, and to worship you and, and uh, to show your glory in everything that we do mm-hmm. and always give credit where credit's due, which is to you, Lord, the creator of all things. Yep. Just, um, just be with us and keep us all safe as we go through our week. And uh, just thank you, God. Thank you for everything you do. In your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, everybody.